Good afternoon, dear students. We are now uh, starting a new type of lecture, and this is the video type. And I would like to use different types of methods in in doing our uh, lectures. We do live online classes. We do also video lectures. And then I hope that uh, COVID nineteen will be gone soon in Saraburi that we can go back into we can come into a face to face class. Now. Uh, before we begin, let's let's pray together. Our forget in heaven, I would like to pray that you may bless us in our lecture today. May you give us understanding, especially my dear students, so that they can understand well about the lesson, especially about the introduction to pastoral care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we are still in chapter 1, and this is uh, the third part of chapter 1, yeah, entitled Introduction to Pastoral Care. Last time we have studied about culture and interculturality. It's very important for us as a pastor. And now we'd like to go to uh, different principles. Yeah, different principles as we uh, go along, as we do our ministry as pastors and doing pastoral care and counseling. The first principle that we need to consider is the principle of multiple perspective. What is this principle? Now, the principle of multiple perspectives realizes that equally rational persons can examine the same issue and yet arrive at very different understandings. It goes on to insist that these different perspectives need to be seen as equally deserving of attention. Through a process of listening and dialogue, one or other or combinations of these perspectives may prove more adequate in coping with a particular issue in a given context. So it's very important, especially right now, I mentioned in the last lecture, that we are really living in a diverse communities. People come from different countries, different perspectives, different practices, okay? But again, the solid foundation should be the Bible. However, in terms of practices, it may not be related directly to the Bible, but it, it, it's related to the culture, to the practices. So in a given situation, in our church, in our communities, yeah, we need to be able to see different perspectives, yes, as equally deserving of attention. We may not say in the beginning that this is right or that is wrong, but we give them a chance to be expressed, yeah, to be expressed, so that we can see different perspectives, yeah, because people, when they come with the different backgrounds. They discuss about the same issue. They may come with different understanding. So the process here is the process of listening, the process of a dialogue, and even combinations of that. And it will be good, yeah, in order to deal with a particular issue in a given context. The second one is the principle of authentic participation. It's very important as well. What is a uh, principle of authentic participation? The principle of authentic participation is premised upon mutual concern for the integrity of the other and affirms the right of all to participate in discussion and examination of an issue on their own terms, realizing that there are strengths and weakness in every approach. Interculturalists seek to encourage diversity through making space for others to participate. This participation is not seen as a as permitted by a tolerant power broker, but rather as a theological imperative of creation. So very important. Principle of authentic participation. That we need to give a chance to everyone to participate. Like for example, in a discussion, we need to give a chance for everyone to express. Yeah, So that uh, we can gain more understanding by having participation from different sides, from different different people. That's why we did we encourage diversity. We make space for people to participate, not for a certain group, like for a majority or the people who are the loudest or something like that to dominate. But as much as possible, we need to be able to give equal participation to all, uh, to everyone. But if we look at here. It doesn't mean that we are tolerant to the power broker. No, we are not tolerant to, to, to like, for example, to sin or something like that. But this is a, an opportunity for the people to participate yeah, equally of everyone. This, 
and interculturality affirms a Trinitarian formulation of human personhood expressed by Kluchkoln and Murray as far as back as 1948. And each assertion of the threefold statement is true and important in itself. And each needs to be held in relation to the others within a unity that holds together and transcends opposites. Now, every human person, yeah, according to them, the trinity of understanding is in certain respects, is like all others, like some others, and like no other. So everybody has this three characteristics here. Yeah. Like all others, like some others, and like no other. Let's see. Now, every be human being is like all others. What do I mean by that? What does the, the book mean by that? That we are all born helpless, grow from dependence toward relative self-management. We relate to other beings and to a physical environment, and then and 10 out of 10 die. We are the same like all others. In this sense, all humans share characteristics that make us distinctly human. So human beings are the same in this case, yeah, in this case, that we are born dependent toward relative self-management, we relate to others being as physical environment, and we die. Yeah, in that sense, we are similar with one another. Now, the next one is, we are like some others. Yeah, what do I mean by that? The second assertion recognizes that precisely because we are human, we are each shaped, influenced, and patterned to some extent by the community within which we are socialized. Now, this matrix of values, beliefs, customs, and basic life assumptions, which we call culture, as we have previously indicated, is shared to a large extent with those who share or have shared the community's life and socializing influences. So, every human being is like some others. And these categories, like some others, are the categories of cultures because we are like certain group of people. Yeah? Shape our beliefs, custom values, and basic life assumptions. Yeah. And the third one is we all like no other. What do I mean by that? The third point to the uniqueness of in each individual. Each person has a unique genetic code voice pattern, fingerprint, and dental configuration. Each person has a distinct life story, developmental history, and particular lifestyle. No other person will ever see, think, feel, celebrate, or suffer in identical way. So everybody is like no other, yeah, because everybody is unique individually. Yeah, the, the fingerprint, dental configuration, the voice, genetic code is different. The, their life story is different. But remember, everybody has three characteristics. That they are like everyone. Yeah. They are similar to everyone. They are born. They are dependent to their parents. They grow. They die. Everybody is also like some others. They are grouped between cultures who shape the customs, values, practices they do together. But everybody is also like no other, which is very unique only to them. Very unique, special voice pattern, fingerprint, dental configuration, life story, developmental history, lifestyle is specific to them only. Now, uh, there are three levels of experience and sphere of influence. The first one is, what of the universal experience of humanity is to be found here? To what extent is a particular experience common to all human beings? The forms of expression and configuration of the experience may differ, but what is universal about the core experience? The second one is, what is culturally determined about this way of thinking, feeling, or behaving? Now, the task here is to attempt to figure out what is what in the experience being confronted is a function of social and cultural forces. Examples of this would include the influence of child-raising practices, socialization, gender and role expectations, and the processes and ideologies of racialization. And the third one for this chapter is, and also this lecture, what in this experience can be said to be uniquely attributable to this particular person. Here, the practitioner needs to see the dif differences that are due to individual particularities shining through the person's experience. So, these are the 
the important points of chapter one. We divided the chapter one into three parts. And for this video lecture, I also shared uh, questions that you need to answer using the H5P. Uh, please, everyone, uh, do that, and that will be counted as your assignment. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's close this uh, lecture with a prayer. Thank you so much, uh, dear Lord, for your guidance in this video lecture. You help our, my students to gain understanding and do their assignment well. Please bless us today. Help us to grow in your daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.